Let's, uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for being a God of great and eternal wisdom to design the story of redemption even before the foundation of the world, to bring uh, your Son to bear in the world even as you promised for ages and ages through the words of prophets and the testimony of the faithful, through the miracles, through the angelic appearances, through things, Lord, that don't make sense to reason and to logic, but, uh, Father, without your personal hand upon things, there would be no Christmas, there would be no testimony. So we know it is from your hand, we know it is above nature, we know that it is you divinely intervening into the history of man and changing it forever. And so, Lord, as we continue to wait on the second coming of Christ, may your spirit dwell strongly with your church and continue to see us grow firm in our testimony and witness and faithfulness. But in all things, Lord, we depend on you for, for all of those things ultimately and for the peace of our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Come in, come in. All right. Okay, as I said, we have one more week after this one to uh, finish up with. And uh, just, just to give you a, a little bit of review, we are in the subject of the means of grace. That is, how it is the Spirit of God ministers to us when after we become Christians and after we are involved in the church and after, now that we're leading our Christian lives, how does the Lord minister to us and serve us and hold us up uh, and continue to guide us in our way? And we call those ways that the Lord touches us and encourages us and strengthens us, we call those the means of His grace, how it is He ministers to us in those ways. And uh, the first way he does that is by the regular preaching of the Word. The Shorter Catechism makes an extra, extra uh, emphasis on his, the, the preaching of the Word as opposed to just the reading of the Word. There's nothing wrong with reading the Bible, and you get, you know, it's, it's, it's what we encourage you to do. But the Catechism, the Divine said, it, the extra measure of being preached to, to hearing the Word of God declared, is the, 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 the work of the Spirit's design to impress that truth into your heart even more and to bring you to conviction even more. So the means of God's grace starts with the preaching of the Word and then there is prayer and prayer is, uh, is, is a, a subject that we won't have time to get into. I, did I bring that? No, I didn't. Um, but, uh, but there's several uh, books on prayer, and I have a, a sermon series on my website on prayer, and I encourage you to, to do that. Prayer is a two-way communication with God, and it's something He invites and compels and even wants you to do. Uh, and so prayer is an important way of receiving the grace of God. And then we jumped in last week to the sacraments or the ordinances. I told you about that word being a carryover from Roman Catholicism. That we, we definitely uh, recognize as a carryover. The word sacrament is, uh, is something that they, they took out of context and applied it to the ordinances. We call them ordinances because they're what Jesus commanded us to do, which is probably another reason why they stuck with sacraments, because they have seven, you remember, and we have limited the definition of a sacrament or an ordinance to just what Jesus commands us to do. And uh, so, uh, by way of that, um, We'll look at the, uh, the um, larger catechism's qu answer to, the, to this question, what is a sacrament? And the answer is a sacrament is a holy ordinance. See, they, I told you, they keep w wrestling with this word business. Instituted by Christ. That's the most important thing. That's why we only have two. Jesus tells us to baptize, Matthew, Great Commission. And he tells us to observe the Lord's Supper. And, and we recognize those as being carryovers from the Old Testament. And he even uh, the, the, then it goes on to say, uh, instituted by Christ in his church to signify and seal. In other words, it's, we're gonna, we're gonna, that's going to be very important to us today uh, with regard to the one we're going to talk about. Uh, 
and exhibit those that are under the covenant of grace the benefits of his mediation. So uh, we focus on the fact that an ordinance is something that is just what Christ commands his church to do. And these are the two most important uh, scripture texts for that. The Great Commission in Matthew 28. Uh, Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then the, the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, do this in remembrance of me. And I, I gave you, uh, reviewed the lesson again about the covenant of redemption and the way that the Old Testament ordinances are really rooted, or the New Testament is really rooted in the Old, and how they're unified, how they're basically the same thing with different practices. So in Genesis 3.15, we had that promise given to Adam and his wife after the fall, that the first promise for the Messiah would come. And the Old Testament is all about waiting for Christ to come. And when Christ comes, then now we are in the New Testament age and we are waiting for Christ's return. And uh, because of that, the, uh, um, the hope of glory, of course, is yet to, yet to come. And so there's a, there's a, a promise of, of Christ that carries all the way through uh, our, our age, we call the covenant of grace, and even into eternity. And so um, we see the connection, and we strongly teach the connection between the Old Testament signs and the New Testament signs and their ultimate fulfillment in glory. And they're always used to anticipate uh, that which is to come. The circumcision and Passover were looking forward to the crucifixion of Christ, the shedding of blood. And then baptism in the Lord's Supper looks forward to our ultimate redemption in Christ. And then when everything is said and done, then we, have, we bear the seal of God and enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so those same two ordinances are always carried throughout the entire story of redemption. And, uh, and, but they change for the, for the three, epical, um, uh, three epics that, uh, that, that we, we arrive at. And uh, so just to illustrate that again with the tree, um, the, Abraham, the father of the faith, Genesis chapter 15, and, and how um, the, uh, the Gentiles are grafted into that tree. So there's no second tree. There's no second people of God. There's no, um, there's no uh, division of Old Testament, New Testament. But, you know, the Israelites will always be Israelites and the new Christians will all be Christians. No, we are one family of God. And so that union starts all the way back with Abraham and continues on today. Right. So we come now this morning to the second of those ordinances. Last week we talked about baptism. This week we talk about the Lord's Supper. This is uh, this also is interesting. You know, we, as I said with baptism, baptism raises a lot of questions. Christians of various branches and, uh, and denominations have come up with uh, all their own interpretations and, and things. Lord's Supper is unfortunately the same way. It's, it's, it's a thing that's divided Christians over the years. It's not something that's necessarily united us, and I think that that's a, that's a real shame. But I hope to make it clear as to why those divisions happen. You know, my, my focus last week was try to tell you why those divisions happened in baptism. Today I want to talk about the divisions that we find in the church regarding the Lord's Supper. Uh, for that ordinance, again, we look at Luke 22, for instance, and he says he took, this was, the, this was while he was celebrating the Passover and uh, anticipating his own sacrifice the next day, he took, the, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said to them, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after they, the, uh, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. So he's, he's saying it's no longer the, the shepherd, I mean, the, the sheep's meat and blood that is part of the ordinance. Now it's my, the symbols of my own body. And, uh, and so there is that replacement. There is that, that uh, the, the Passover is no longer to be celebrated by the Church of Christ. Sometimes we hear about satyrs, you know, and it's interesting to hear how the Jewish people, uh, even today, continue to practice uh, Passover in, in, in their traditions, but it's not like we can celebrate that in, in support of them because 
Paul, for instance, stresses that that has been replaced by the Lord's Supper. And so it's the Lord's Supper that should be the focus of that. But because its roots are in Passover, we need to understand what Passover was. So what was Passover? Uh, Passover, of course, was, was uh, first instituted or, uh, at, by God before the Exodus. Everybody remember the Exodus story? You know, the Jews were slavers, you know, slaves in Egypt, and uh, Moses was called of God to bring them out, and they went through all of these plagues, trying to get Pharaoh to let the Israelites go, and it came up nine plagues later, Pharaoh is not going to give them up. Comes to the tenth plague, and God gives Moses instructions that are the most radical yet. And he says, what I want you to do is I want you to have your families take a lamb and sacrifice it and cook the meat. You're going to eat the meat of the lamb at, at midnight that night. Uh, and while you're doing that, he says, before you do that, I want you to take the blood and paint it over the doorpost. Remember that? Paint the blood on the doorpost because... what. Uh, uh, and, and why that would happen, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll find out in a minute. And then at night, in the middle of the night, they were to eat the Passover lamb, and they were to be dressed, staffs in hand, suitcase packed, everything ready to go, because when the angel of death, as it was referred to, is passes over, that's where the word comes from, it will strike the firstborn of every house unless it sees that blood on the doorpost. Now, that's a very interesting point to, 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 to bring out here, is that the, the blood on the doorpost was not just a sign, not just, you know, hey, it, we're here, it, this is your people, yo. It wasn't just a sign. The blood on the doorpost was a foreshadowing of the cross. To stand under the cross is what the Christian does to to be delivered of his own sins. In the same way, the Israelites were standing under the bloody doorpost, in this, which, which tells you what? Not just simply that, it, it's not like God couldn't tell an Israelite house from an Egyptian house. What he was really saying was, is that unless you are under the blood of the Passover lamb, you will be destroyed too. The, the plague was going to address every house in Egypt, slave and free. And the only ones who would be delivered would be the ones who stood under the blood of the doorpost. And so that's the background. And at midnight they ate because they were being, they were, the angel would pass over their house. The firstborn of the Egyptians would die. And the next day, you remember, uh, Pharaoh was willing to, to let them go. That's the, that's the background. Now, so when we come over to the New Testament, what do we do with that background? What do we do with that meaning? How do we interpret that into the New Testament? How do we make it, the, the Old Testament sign, play into the New Testament practice? Um, here's where the, some of the viewpoints have gone a little bit astray, in our opinion. I'll start with the, with the biggest uh, reinterpretation of the Lord's Supper, and that's Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism holds to a doctrine they have called transubstantiation. Big hairy word. Transubstantiation means, have you ever been to a, a Roman Catholic Mass? And, um, and you watch the priest and he, they go through all of their things. He's dressed in nice robes. They don't have a Lord's table. They have an altar. They're, first of all, that's your first hint. They call it an altar. The one doing the service is called a priest, not a minister. And then they have the, um, what they call the host, which is the wafer. Um, Maybe you've seen that, the wafer. There's a reason that they've made it a wafer and not a loaf of bread, which is ironic because the wafer's not made of bread at all. But at a certain point in, his, in the Mass, he will hold the host up. 
so everybody can see it. A bell will ring, and then he brings it down and he begins to serve everybody else. What's going on there is there, the Roman Catholics claim that when he holds that host up and the bell rings, that does literally turn into the, bre- the, the body of Christ. Same with the cup, he holds that up, it literally turns into the blood of Christ. It's a literal transformation. And so that, that, uh, the, the idea is, is that they're trying to make it real to the worshipers so that they'll regard it as holy. Okay, I appreciate that. But in the process, what are they logically doing? They're sacrificing Christ again and again and again every single time they do it. Well, the scriptures say God, Jesus died once for all. Uh, it's done. We're celebrating the memory of it to begin with. That's what, that's what Jesus said in, in the, at the Passover. And when he instituted the Lord's Supper, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Don't sacrifice me again and again and again. Even here, he picks up the bread. He is in his body. He's not having them, he's not breaking off a finger saying, you eat this and you eat that and you eat that. He's, he's saying, this represents my body. That, of course, is, goes without saying, doesn't it? It's logical. And so he's saying this, do this in remembrance of me. After I'm gone, I want you to take bread like this and I want you to eat it. But, but it's not, there's nothing supernatural about the transformation. And yet that's what the Roman Catholics believe. And, uh, and that goes, there's, there's many other uh, reasons for that that I'm not going to bother going into right now. When Martin Luther started the Reformation in 1517, he was not necessarily against this. Martin Luther, remember, was uh, his primary objection, I mean, he had issues with the church, but his primary objection was selling forgiveness. And he said, that we can't do that anymore. We've got to get rid of that idea. But in his heart of hearts, he didn't want to leave the Roman Catholic Church. But the Roman Catholic Church kind of left him, kicked him out. And, uh, and so he, had, he was kind of forced into starting his own church. That you know they, they soon began to call that Lutheranism. And when Lutheranism b- developed their view of the Lord's Supper, they said, well, we need to reject the idea of the Mass but not go too far off the, off the range. <laughs> he wanted to keep the priests. He wanted to keep the, 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 the pomp and circumstance. He wanted to keep the, the, uh, the drama. He wanted to keep all of the robes. He wanted to keep all of that. He just, just said, we just, we just have to change it a little. And so the Lutherans began to call it consubstantiation. And what that meant was is that uh, there's, there's smiling Luther, and, um, and uh, you know, he focused on those words of Jesus that we, took, uh, we looked at. This is my body. And he, said, he just got hung up on this. He just couldn't let that go. He said, he, Jesus said, this is my body. It's, it's got, you know, now, yet he said, but he was sitting there. He didn't, like I said, he didn't offer him a hand. He didn't offer them a foot. He offered him bread. He said, I understand that. But still, he said, this is my body. He could not get over that. And uh, much uh, and 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 so Lutherans to this day will practice the Lord's Supper in in a, in a way that looks very much like Roman Catholicism, but they say no, we're, we, there's no bell, there's no transformation. However, he says the body of Christ, you know, it's it's represented in a much more way than just simply symbolical. And the terms they used, it said the body of Christ is, is in the bread somehow. Spiritually, it's in the bread. It's under the bread. It's, it's in there. And, uh, and when, the, when the priest goes through his, 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 uh, his actions and he serves it to you, it is a holy piece of bread. And you need to be careful about that. You need to be careful about that because it's a holy piece of bread. And uh, it became so... Um, uh, it became a, a big deal. He just couldn't let that go, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. That's uh, what what that what the real problem there was in a second. Luther had a contemporary. His name was uh, Ulrich Zwingli, 
and Zwingli developed what was called the memorial uh, way of observing the Lord's Supper. The memorial way is, we look at the same words, you know, do this in remembrance of me. He says there's nothing, you know, Zwingli said there's nothing supernatural about this. We're just doing this in remembrance of Jesus. And so he took a very low view of the practice of the Lord's Supper. Well, you know, it's, there's nothing magical about this. There's nothing supernatural about this. We're just, we're just doing this. Now, Zwingli was reformed just like Luther was reformed. And... Uh, but his, his focus on this was to reject the Roman Catholic Church in every way, shape, and form. Whereas Luther wanted to hold on to the vestiges and stuff, and he liked the robes, and he liked the drama, and everything. I don't want to give that up. And Zwingli was saying, no, we've got to throw it all away. The church has to be simple. It's got to be a simple, uh, simple congregation, we, simple worship. We do what the Bible says and no more. And Luther just couldn't couldn't swallow that. It got to the point where they actually got together. They hammered out 15 points of doctrine. 14 of those 15 points they agreed with. The 15th point was on the Lord's Supper. And Luther just dug in his heels and said, no, he said, Jesus says, this is my body, and I believe him. And Zwingli said, no, it's just, it's, he's just speaking allegorically. Clearly that's the case. It's just a memorial. And they could not agree on that one point. And as a result of that, to this day, we still have the Lutheran Church, and we still have the Reformers, and for a long time they agreed on the very same doctrine except that one thing having to do with the Lord's Supper. Well, finally, a man comes along named John Calvin, and he says, I think you're all wrong. <laughs> it's kind of like Calvin, right? I think you're all wrong. He says, I think that what we have here is a spiritual communion with God, a communion with God linked by the Holy Spirit. We go through the, the process of communion, but it's the Spirit within us and in each other that ties us together with those who have even gone before as well as with Christ in glory. And so he says there is some, there is, he, he's, he's taking the focus of the Lord's Supper and dramatically changing it. Now, that was, that was a radical thing to do. Because what he began to say was, it's in you. You are the change. There's no dong. There's no bread that's going to change. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. And when you come to the table... You are acknowledging the fact that you're a Christian and that you're partaking this out of obedience to what God has done in you. Now, you know, that sounds, that might sound great right off the bat, but you know what the logical next step was for Calvin? And that was, well, Paul says we have to be careful about taking communion. A man ought to examine himself, Paul says, before he eats and breeds, eats and bre eats the bread, drinks the cup, lest he pour judgment upon himself. And so Calvin started saying, okay, you know, you guys who are not living a Christian life, we're not going to let you partake of the Lord's Supper. And they said, what are you talking about? Because they were used to the idea that if I eat the bread and drink the cup, it magically is going to change me. There is something about the elements that is supernatural and my salvation is linked to my eating that. And Calvin said, no, you've misunderstood it completely. The Lord changes you and you are witnessing to that when you come to the communion table. So it caused a lot of fracas, as you might imagine. A lot of big deal. Well, here's the, here's the bottom line. To make it very simple, here's the division. Both the Roman, the Roman Catholics and the Lutherans have what I call an objective focus on the Lord's Supper. What that means is they're, look, they're both looking at the elements. Now they define what the elements are differently, but they are focusing on the elements. The, the bread is magical. The wine is supernatural. There's something special about this. It's holy. There's something about that element. And when I take it, that changes me. 
That makes me somehow more holy. So they both have what we call an objective focus. That we're focusing on the object. All right? But in, in both the Zwinglian and the Calvin memorial look, the focus is on the subject, the one who partakes. That's where the spirit, that's where the, the wondrous, miraculous work of God ha takes place, is in the subject. And so when you, that's why, that's why for instance, it's, you know, the logical step is for you to uh, profess faith, if you haven't already had baptism, to receive baptism, and then you are to come to the Lord's Supper. Because the Lord's Supper is not going to change you. Not, it's not going to do it automatically. It's not going to do it for you. The Spirit of God has to change in you all first, and then you confess that. That's what, I am a Christian. And then you come because now the Spirit of God dwells in you, and you can partake and, and be strengthened by it. And so the focus is on the subject, the recipient of the, Holy, of the work of the Holy Spirit. And that, that means that our connection with the church is a, a very unifying one. You know, each Christian starts with that rela personal relationship with God. Each Christian has that personal transformation in his heart and soul, what we call conversion. You, 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 you give your testimony. When you, you know, if you were to... If you were to come before the congregation or come before the session, you would give your testimony. We would say, well, how has the Lord worked in your heart? And you would tell us. We want to hear how the Lord has worked. The Spirit of God has come into your life. That's an important thing we want to hear. But, when that, but as real as that is, that's not the end. Then each congregation unites together. When we come, we, that's why we have the Lord's Supper not in homes anymore, but together in the, in the church. It's a part of the worship of God. We come together to do the Lord's Supper. And each congregation unites together in being the church of Christ. And, and then, you know, it realizes that that also is meant to unify us with congregations all over the world as we do this. We, we, we share in that communion. We celebrate the Lord's Supper together because we're bearing testimony and witness of what God has done in all of us. And then, as, as per Calvin's perspective, we are uniting with all those who have gone before and all those who will go on before, uh, after us and all those in heaven and, and in glory. And, uh, and that, you know, so the more and more time passes, the more communion becomes more like the marriage supper of the Lamb. The communion is already advancing and moving forward to, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Any questions about that? Okay, all right. Well, now that gets us into how we practice communion. Um, what is the proper way to do that? There, you, if you've been to uh, several churches, you probably know of several different varieties of ways that communion is observed in a service. Some churches will do it every week. Some churches do it once a year. Some churches do it you know, uh, maybe eight or nine times a year. Others will do it on a regular basis, like monthly, like we do it. The Bible doesn't tell us how often we are to do the Lord's Supper, just that we are to do it in remembrance of Christ. And so, lots of churches will vary on that practice. We leave that up to the session to decide. Uh, and and it, 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 there is, But there isn't, the bottom line is, is there isn't any specific a number of times a year that the church is to gather to do that. But when we do, there are some things that we want to do and there are some things we want to avoid doing. For instance, you might notice if you've been to uh, Methodist churches, for instance, they have all across the front of their platform, they have a kneeling rail and when people come for communion, they get up out of, their, out of their chairs, they come forward, and they kneel at the, at the, at the alt, they still call it an altar, at the altar to receive communion from the priest. Why do they do that? Well, some might say, well, we're doing that because we, we want to be humble in our appreciation 
for it. Um, but when they come up and they kneel, they are being fed the, the communion by the, by the priest in much the same kind of way that you do in a Roman Catholic church. And the inference is, is that there is, they are worshiping the object. Remember that contrast? You've got the objective and you've got the subjective. Even the Methodists have focused more on the object. They see the object as holy. And so they kneel before that. And they are fed the holy uh, bread. And they're fed, given the holy drink. And so there's the focus is more on the object, and so they revere that, and they practice it that way. Um, reform, reform thinking says, no, we shouldn't do that. We should not worship the holy object. It's not the object that's holy. It's me. I'm the, I'm the Christian. I'm the one that God has changed. I'm holy. That's why it should have effect on how I live and move and what it comes out of my mouth and what I, what I do. I'm the holy one. So I should not be worshiping an object. I should stand or sit to receive the, 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 the reminder that, that Christ loves me. So that's out. Another thing we don't do is we don't stand in line. Now, I think this is a, this is a uh, I don't know which church this is. The man is, the man is in a, a robe. It could be a... Uh, I can't tell. It's it, it, but well, there, yeah, but the, the, you know the stations have been borrowed by others too, but uh, but uh, but it it is it is a way that the Roman Catholics will practice this as well. Now you know they're standing in line. Now what's what's is there? They're not kneeling. Is this the right way to do it? What do you think? Somebody give me an idea what they think. Yeah, the, the, there's a, there, because of the robes and everything else, and he's feeding you, it's, there's a priestly aspect to this. What's missing? Remember I said that it was the, the, the communion that ties us together? Yeah, no. Yes, very good, very good. You notice that if you're standing in line, it's just, again, it's just you and God. You and God. You and God. You have no communion. That's another word they use to talk about the Lord's Supper. It's communion. Fellowship with believers. And so we don't, we don't like to do that either. Now, I have to, I, I, there, one faux pas, one mistake that even the reformed reformers committed uh, back in Scotland um, was uh, giving way to pragmatism. And that was that uh, when they were serving communion to the people, they said, this is taking too long. Does that sound like a Presbyterian to you, by the way? This is taking too long. We're going to start passing it down the rows. And so you get trays of bread, and you start passing it, take it, pass it down a row, and another elder will be on the other side to intercept it, and then we'll go down one more. Then we'll take another tray, we'll pass it down a row. It was Presbyterians that started that. Drives me nuts. Mo lots of churches still do it because it's, because it's just pragmatic, it's convenient, it doesn't take a lot of time. What is, the, what is the primary problem with that, you think? The motive of concern of time. Well, pragmatism, yes. Yeah, yeah pragmatism is the first objective. But, right. but there's also, there is an authority that the elder is to have over you. And he releases that authority when he sends it down the row. And... But that also, now, now I'm sitting in my chair and I'm minding my own business. The communion comes to me. Thank you very much. I don't have to answer the call to go to, to Christ. And if it comes by, and I know I don't really deserve it and I have no really business doing this, but I'm going to try it anyway. You know, maybe my focus is on the object. Maybe I think it's going to save me somehow. And who's to say no or who's to guard it or who's to even know that I'm doing it? There's a disconnect between authority and that communion aspect. And so when, you know, when we, we wrestled with that here. That was when I first came. That's why we did it. And we said, no, let's, let's change it. Let's change it. How are we going to change it? Well, the Scots 
church was thoroughly Presbyterian in the, after the Reformation, and they had this down in a very practical way that uh, was actually quite beautiful. And they changed it when they decided to go in this passing it down the rows business. Let me show you what I mean. This is Fairview PCA in Fountain in South Carolina. And they are in the worship service and they are sitting at table together. Now this takes a special, special furniture, you know. They set up just for communion. And you'll notice, you know, it, it's, it's because of the pragmatism of the, because of the element of the structure of the building, it's long and lean. There's all very, all kinds of variations on this. When I went to, when I went to Scotland to, to do my doctoral work, there were all kinds of creative ideas about how to get around this. Um, one church, uh, the pews didn't start for 20 feet. You have the pulpit, you had a, a dance floor. And then you had the pews. And the reason for that was is because they would set up tables between the pews and the, and the, and the pulpit. You would come and sit at the tables. <laughs> it was kind of, you know, but, uh, but that was, okay, that was a little awkward. And then one church really had a neat invention. They had, uh, they had you know, in, in, in those days, many churches would have rental boxes instead of just pews. You know, your, your dad would, uh, would say, well, I'm a man about town. I'm pretty prestigious, so I'm going to rent my, uh, my box. And that's that's my that's my that's where I sit every every Sunday. They had boxes, but then the walls of the boxes would could be removed, and so they would slide out the the, the walls of the boxes and turn the things sideways, and thus you would have the tables for communion Sunday going right down the middle. I don't have a picture of that, but um, the practice was that we want to simulate sitting at table together as much as we could possibly do that. And that was the original Scottish vision. And it's beautiful. It really is. Here is a, let me show you another picture of that. This is Independent Presbyterian in Savannah, Georgia. You go into, into Independent Presbyterian, this is a church building that'll, that'll have, seat a thousand worshipers. So it's a big place. But one thing you notice is, is that the aisle is 10 feet wide. Well, why would you need a 10-foot wide aisle? On Communion Sundays, they bring out these tables. They're, they're one foot wide by three feet wide. And they line them all up. And the various people take turns coming to the center aisle and sitting at the table to be served communion. It's a beautiful thing. It really is. Quite neat. So, you know, we're wrestling with that kind of concept here. How can we make that work here? And uh, we, had, we, had turned the, we had turned the worship room sideways. And so our, you know, we really didn't have a, a lot of options. And so one of the things we came up with was is that we would have, we, we would, we have three long tables in the front. We have uh, two on the side. And, uh, and what we have, we tell people to, to come up in families, in rows. We... You know, in groups of, of friends, uh, visitors with, 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 with professions of faith come, and we, and we stand together on that side. We don't just march them through. You know, it's not one after another. It's not an assembly line. But they come and they stay at the table. Now they're standing, which is the best we can do. I understand that. But they, they stand at the table, and we feed them the bread together, this is always a, a, a neat thing for me as a pastor because um, uh, I remember one family um, was three generations, three generations in the same congregation, and they would always come up, and here's, here's the children and the parents and the grandchildren, and they're all just celebrating together, and it was just real neat. Well, now I have, I have one family that's four generations. Anybody know who that is? The Fosters, yes. They're four generations, and they're all there together. And it is such a neat thing to see. It is just a neat thing to see. It's very gratifying to me as a pastor. Um, and we, we serve them in the basket because I'm not, I'm not feeding you in your mouth because it's not a holy peace, remember? And 
And yes, it's a bit crumbly, but you don't have to worry about it if you drop some. That's the Roman Catholic problem. That's, that's, that's the Roman Catholics. They have a real issue. Well, we can't have crumbs of Christ's body on the floor. People walking on it can't have that. So they come up with a wafer that dissolves in your mouth because you can't chew it for Pete's sake. You can't just masticate the, you know, the body of Christ. They have to work around their own you know, thing. And, but the wafer is, is not, it's not made of bread. It's, it's rice cake, I think. And, uh, and, they, and, they, and they feed it to you so that you don't, they don't want to put it in your hand because you might drop it. So they put it in your mouth, you know, they're trying to uh, pragmatic. And then, of course, you come along with, the, with, the, with the, the chalice, and they have the towel under your chin, right? Don't spill it. Don't spill it. And, of course, there are always a few drops. And so they put that napkin in the little storeroom until it's unusable again. And if they still do it, when it gets to be a point of uh, you can't wash it, it's the blood of Christ. So what do you do? Well, you, you burn it. Yeah, that's right, we'll burn it. That sounds honorable. What do you do with the ashes? Anybody have a guess? The priests eat it. You, what else are you going to do with it? It's holy. You, get, you got it. They have to work around the whole thing. It's just, it's just because the focus is on the object. Now it's a problem. Every once in a while, you know, and we're, we're the opposite side of the coin. We are subject focused, remember? Now this always t does tend to bother people sometimes when they come out of that kind of object focused theology and they see what we do with the elements after the service. Sometimes it offends people. The deacons will take the bread that's left over and they'll dump it in a bag or they'll put it out and the kids will gobble it up. And sometimes people have, have a real problem with that. They say, there's nothing holy about the bread. No, it's not, nothing holy about the bread and it's not a worship of God. Let them eat it. We're not afraid of it. And it's a reminder of the fact that we are subject oriented. It's the person coming before the Lord in worship that matters. Well then, so you partake of the bread together at the table, and then we ask you to be dismissed with the cup in your hand, and you come around and you sit down, and we drink of the cup as a, as a church body. So there's that communion aspect. And we try to cultivate that in every way we can. And so that's, that's the way we have reconciled ourselves, returned ourselves to Scottish theology as much as, as, much as practically possible. Yeah, Tom. One of the things the Roman Catholic Church has, has adopted is um, the, there, there is a special tank these days that's buried under the, um, what's it called, the sacristy. And they do have a way of actually washing the, washing <laughs> okay. the linen. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll appreciate that. They have to figure out something. They've got to figure something out. You know, it must be holy soap, it must be something. But I mean, they've got it. They have so much built around protecting that mistaken theology that it just. It, it my point is, is that it becomes ludicrous. Louise, I have a communion story. Okay. Six years old in a large Catholic church in Corpus Christi. Was going to have my first holy communion. I got sick, and I couldn't be there with. Yes, yes. Now, this is the, the grouping and so forth included my first cousin who, who had a pretend angel costume. <laughs> okay. Behind me, I'm walking up there, right? Well, I never took communion. Oh, no, I, I went up to the thing by myself. The angel was behind me. Standing back. I go up there on a long, long altar rail, and I got my communion. And I thought, now I'm what? I'm six or seven years old. And I'm thinking, well, now, Louise, you don't just jump up. You just don't jump up from here. Because I'm by myself. I was sick when everybody else was <laughs> going in. I'm by myself. 
So I didn't have my cousin there even because I had been sick when everybody else got this, right? So I'm a, in my outfit. I'm in my right. everything. Yes. And I'm up there pausing. And all of a sudden, there were two priests because it was a big church. So I had received communion from the first priest. Lo and behold, I look up, and there's another priest handing me communion. Well, what am I going to do? <laughs> the nun who was standing yeah, by yeah. the first row went was, ballistic. Yeah, she was angry with you for not, not moving. I mean, for, not verbally. They don't talk verbally right. to you. They go, <laughs> like, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it, is, is another, that reminds me of another, another thing that, uh, that being object-focused is a problem of. Um, in, in many churches, not just Roman Catholics, but in many churches, they have what they call confirmation, which is a big point in your young life, 10, 12 years old, where you're taking your first communion. And, of course, what does mommy want you to do? How does she want you to dress for your first communion? Okay, okay. But when you address for your first communion, what do you dress in? in? Absolute pure white, like, a, like it's a wedding gown or something. Mm -hmm. What's theologically wrong with that? You're not what? What? A white robe, but it's white. Yeah, white, white represents purity. And you are not partaking of the Lord's Supper because you're pure. You are a sinful being that the Lord has had grace upon you and forgiven you. You become, you should be dressed in white after your first communion. That's what you should do. But they come as, and pretend like, oh, this is, you know, such a pure child and, and taking this, this big, and it's, again, it's the object. It's the focus on the object and not the focus on the person. I'm one rule quick one. We were getting married. Protestant, of course, I wouldn't do that. And here you are. <laughs> and here we are. And we're having communion, and we're, you know, we're special. We've just been married, so we go up there just as a couple, and there's the white tablecloth and the priest and everything. And it was so surreal, I can hardly bring it to my mind again. But the priest knocked the chalice. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I've never heard of that before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Noah, do you have something? Yeah, I was going to ask about the method that we use because you were saying how the authority aspect isn't a good thing. Like, you shouldn't be passing down the road. Right. It should be coming to the communion. Yeah. We, we, we hold to the idea that Christ calls us to the communion table. It's an act of visible obedience. Even when we made the shift many years ago here, we did get some objections, some pushback, because people were felt embarrassed to get up, felt awkward about getting up and walking forward. And I said, that's, a, that's exactly why you should do it, I said. My one, my one question about that is, I know, I know we're coming up to receive the communion still, but we're still like being offered it instead of it being on the table. And is there no authority there? Since the well, the idea is, is that the elders are handing it to you. And, and so that, that's represented in that way. Uh, it's not just set out for you. Now, you know, you bring up a couple of other things. There's, there's other things that I just have tripped over. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've, been to, I've been to churches that, that they cover the, the elements in a linen cloth. You ever seen anything like that? Yeah. And they make a big deal about lifting the pail, that's what it's called, and folding it very nicely and setting it aside. And then after it's over, they, they, the ushers get back, they unfold it and they cover the table again. I don't even like the, the lids with the crosses on them. I don't even like that. We've got them, and, uh, and, but, you know, they just, I don't, I don't like them at all. I just leave them off. I, just, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like them, using them anymore. And, um, and the idea of closing it up and, and covering the, uh, do you do that at Thanksgiving dinner? Do you close the, do you cover the leftover turkey with some kind of, do you, you know, do you cover the beans? 
Do you cover the, you know, the cranberry sauce with something? No, it's a de it's a meal. And and so I, I get all kind of finicky about that. Right, right, which is a whole other thing. <laughs> huh? Confirmation. Yep. All right, so just to review, the Roman Catholics, the Lutherans, others are object-focused, holy wafer, holy drink. We are subject-focused. We want to have the testimony of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And so the elements are, are, are just signs and seals. Like we said before, there's nothing special about them. Just make sure you get that straight, okay? And then um, if you can read a couple more chapters in the Confession for, for next week. Next week's the last one. And uh, we, uh, we thank you very much. Uh, you guys have been a great class. Everybody get all the blanks filled in? Well, good, because it's going to be graded at the end of it. No. <laughs> Final exam next week, yes. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you very much for your blessing and the teaching that comes straight from your word, how easy it is for us to understand. Father, forgive your church for having so many misinterpretations, differences of opinion, uh, Lord, and help us to... Um, wrestle with, continue to wrestle with that and to, to grow to seek uh, unity with one another. We thank you that we may come before you and worship now and we ask your blessing upon it in Christ's name, amen. If you missed this uh, little folder on baptism, I've got some extras.